Uh, you may have read recently a piece uh, that Mike wrote for Filmmaker Magazine called uh, TV is Not the New Film, which has caused kind of quite a buzz. Um, it had some people really talking. Uh, and we invited Mike to kind of expand on that idea um, and to provide any uh, additional topics that he'd like to discuss. He's really a fascinating speaker, uh, and we're excited to have Mike here with us. So please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. How's it going, everybody? Thanks for hanging in here at the end of a long day. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, uh, mostly it's about cinema, about where we are with cinema, what the future is, or what I think where it's heading right now, and to take stock of this platform called cinema. Uh, the, the article I wrote uh, is about clarifying the fact that there is a difference between cinema and TV. I'm not saying one is better than the other, I'm just saying they're different. And that's kind of the point of what I'm looking towards in the future, uh, towards filmmakers being really aware of what cinema means and how it's different. So just starting off, you know, I think that everybody in this room is probably a storyteller in some form or another, uh, and everybody's got different reasons to tell stories. Um, sometimes you just want to tell your own story or you want to just tell another person's story. Uh, and sometimes people don't even have stories to tell. They just love a certain platform. They just want love images. And so I think as we go forward, everybody's got to understand that some stories are better at other platforms than others. And <clears throat> I always say, if you feel that your film or your story could be told in TV, you probably should be making it in TV. And uh, what we have is a lot of people <clears throat> who start to say that a script is a blueprint. And I think one of the things we have to realize, and what I say in the article, is basically, if your script is a blueprint, it probably should be done in TV. And that what we have in film is a point of view expressed through a director, which is different than the script. And so that's one of the basic things that I think we have to kind of think about <clears throat> as we go forward. Um, you know, <clears throat> a lot of times through time as mediums become threatened by new technologies. We have this anxiety of obsolescence. We believe, or we're threatened, that the new technology is going to make the old one worthless or less valuable. In the 50s, the novel was under threat by TV. And a lot of people said the novel was going to die, that it was over. And in reality, what happened was that the novel Basically, the, the bottom, the financial bottom, which was Pulp Fiction, dropped out of the whole basic novel narrative business. And that was because TV came in and took over a lot of the commercial pulp novels that were happening at the time. What happened then was a kind of a distillation of the impulse to tell narratives in the novel form. And what happened then was some of the greatest writers that we've had in America happened during the time when the novel died. Cheever, Updike, Salinger. And I think we can look and say that when the commercial reason for a medium to exist decline, that there is possibly a positive correlation with the medium becoming more pure for what it's intended for. And what I'm also saying is that I think cinema is at that place right now where it's becoming less valuable to the distraction industry or the entertainment industry. I think that there are a lot of forms that you can choose to tell your story in. And there's a lot of forms that are more popular than cinema. And I think that, especially with young people under the age of 30, there's something biologically not in line with the 
requirements of a 90-minute feature format experience. Um, I think it's harder for a lot of young people to sit still for 90 minutes. And I think there's just too much great TV and there's too much other content competing for the interest that we used to always have in the 20th century. And I think that we have to recognize the fact, I don't want to call the cinemas in decline, but we have to recognize the fact that there's too many other, that there's a lot of other competing platforms for narrative interest. And so if you're going to make a film, there has to be a reason to justify it that's beyond the fact that you just want to tell your story in 90 minutes. And that's what the article goes into, which is trying to figure out exactly what are the elements that make up a film, a cinema experience, that's different than a TV experience. And a lot of those are formal. It's not content driven, it's formal. It's how we experience a narrative in 90 minutes. And specifically, it has to do with the role of the narrator in relation to the story. The story not being a blueprint, the script not being a blueprint, and the story being an experience that's beyond plot. So I think when we look at the fact that the cinema form is in decline in the sense that it's obvious, the numbers are down. You know, overall they'll say Hollywood numbers are the highest it's ever been for one year, but in reality, there's about 10% of the product getting almost all that numbers. So the tail has gone way down. Uh, people are attending cinemas less than they used to for anything other than the 10 blockbusters. And the general zeitgeist around film is less than what it used to be. 19th century was about the novel, the 20th century was about cinema, and the 21st century, I would say, at least as we look at it right now, is about episodic long-form TV. So what do we do about the fact that some of you want to be storytellers specifically in the cinema form? And is there any hope? And for that, I'd like to say that there is. But if you're so-called platform agnostic and you don't care what form to tell your story in, then you should not be in cinema and you should not be making a 90-minute feature film because the audience doesn't want it. They don't need it. And they're going to go with the convenience factor of, their, of all the other platforms. But if you are not platform agnostic and you do love cinema and you understand how cinema can tell stories differently than TV, I actually feel like the future is looking very good. And <clears throat> there's a company right now, a uh, distribution company, A24, and I feel like they have the same they're bullish in the same way, and they're positive in the same way. And they have been distributing films, picking films, which are distinctly cinematic experiences. Ex Machina did really good business. It was a cinematic experience. They picked up the winner of South by Southwest, a completely no budget, no stars film, Kishna, um, which I was happy to see at the rooftop, and it'll be coming out. This is like a Cassavetti-style family drama told in a very visual, cinematic way. The narrator is present and in a way that is not displayed in TV. And they pick this film up and they're going to make his next film. And so as a business model, them, and also I think Amazon Studios too is thinking the same way, is that the market for cinema is getting smaller. But the product is going to get more distinctive. And just like in the 50s, when the novel business was destroyed by TV, what happened was a modulation into the, the purest form of the novel. And the novel became a place where if you wanted to engage in the world in a way that was different than TV, you went to it. So it's kind of a dialectical relationship between the fact that the de overall demand for the medium on a commercial level is declining, and the fact that if people do go and they're going to invest the time in either reading a novel or 90 minutes, it's got to be something special. So <clears throat> I think it's important that we really have to we're, recognize the fact that we're at a transition time 
with how the public, how the consumer views this, this, this means of this, this model cinema. Um, and we have to understand the fact that the numbers are down and they're going to get lower. I think as the AI helmet comes in and you start to get the uh, artificial intelligence engagement with narrative like we saw at the Sundance New Frontiers this year, it's going to start to even bring the numbers down on Avengers and everything because people are going to be engaged in narrative through this kind of three-dimensional helmet experience. Um, and that's probably just a few years away. And so we're going to see gaming <coughs> come into another space and it's going to get more sophisticated in a narrative way um, that's really going to even hurt the numbers more for Hollywood. And I think the studios know that too. You see the studios investing their money into other platforms. So when you see you, you know, Universal or Fox putting money into BuzzFeed or Vice TV, and they're in the entertainment narrative business, visual narrative business, you see the writings on the wall here. Um, so I like to talk to people. I'm just interested in cinema. That's all I'm interested in. I'm interested in character-driven, visually told stories. And so for me, I'm in for the long haul, you know? Just because the public isn't interested anymore, I'm not a businessman in that way. I'm not gonna suddenly start making widgets because I once loved making tires. It's not that way. I'm, I'm in it, this is it. And I think the only people who are in it should feel the same way. And they should know what the nature of the plastics of the medium is, of cinema. And you should know that the cinematic experience is different than a TV experience, and that I think that there's going to be a demand for that type of film. This idea that <clears throat> a famous TV writer is going to step into the indie space and make an indie film as a director because they were a successful TV writer, and then they make an ordinary film that could just as well have been split up into four sections in TV, what does that do? The consumer feels burned, there's no sense of anything unique, and there's nothing there to really justify the fact that they should be working in a 90-minute format. And so I don't think that anybody who can say to themselves, this could be either a film or a TV show, is if they're making film, I think that inevitably the consumer is going to vote them down. And I think we're seeing that a little bit. And I think it's going to happen more and more. So, you know, that's, I think that as we face that reality that the medium is different, we've got to have everybody else who's in our space adjust to that. And specifically what I mean is right now everybody's scared because the numbers are so low, we feel the decline in interest and people are getting conservative. So you have programmers of festivals, you've got distributors, you've got investors, and you've got filmmakers saying, I need to make my film more like TV because everybody likes TV. And that's not going to get us anywhere. And in fact, we've seen a lot of loss that way with a lot of those types of films that actually stay in the theaters less than some bold vision, visual films um, because the audience just doesn't want to waste the time on that 90-minute experience if it's the same thing. And so everybody has got to start to think about the fact that their product, their line, is not in demand as it once was and it's got to be special and it's got to be distinguished differently. Just to say some other things I think that also have to change um, you know, as we go forward into this new, this new era <clears throat> is the rules of the game were set up. Specifically, I'm talking about business and you know, the way it works is we get actors involved, then we find investors, then we make the film and then we hope a distributor will pay us the money that's greater than what our investors paid for the film. And that's the game that works. And then it goes out into this distribution land, which has been diversified through multiple platforms, as we all know. 
and in reality, transparency is less than it's ever been, uh, and we're seeing less returns, and the purchase prices are way lower than they've ever been. I was making films before 2008, um, and, and the kind of reality numbers that we had before then compared to what they are now are shocking uh, difference. Um, but one thing is that, ha that the numbers have changed, the purchase price has changed, our budgets have gotten lower. But one thing that has not changed is the basic terms of the distribution deal. And I like to talk, just use this platform, this, this microphone right now to, to reiterate something that I'm always telling and saying to other producers and that I also say to a lot of distributors. This 18 year, 12 year, exclusive term deal has got to stop. Um, normally what we do is, <clears throat> you know, when we, let's say, lease the film, after we make the film, we lease the film to Sony Classics or to, to Oscilloscope or to Magnolia, and uh, we end up with like a 18 year exclusive deal or 12 year where they've exclusively got that rights to distribute it themselves and there's nothing we can do. All they have to do is everything. And generally, after about two years, they do nothing. They throw it up on the platform and it's gone. We've got to go to, a, at maximum, a five-year exclusive deal as filmmakers and as producers and as investors. We've all got to get united on this. Uh, we've got to basically say to distributors, you can have it exclusively for five years. After that, we're going to share it. You can have your deal still in place with Netflix or whatever you've set up with a, with a TV outlet that's maybe a 12-year deal. You'll still have that. But we need to get it back. We meaning the investors, the filmmaker, and the producer. And we need to get it back in under five years so that we can put it our own site. And one of the beauties of a new technology is called VHX. And VHX technology is going to allow for every filmmaker to sell their own film on their own site. And we need to get that back. And the old 18-year lease or the 15-year lease was due to a time when the NGs were higher. And so when I talk about all of us facing reality and opening our eyes, it's not just filmmakers or storytellers, but it's also the business end of situation that as producers and investors and directors who love this 90-minute format, this 120-minute feature format, we're working as underdogs <clears throat> in a space which is overcrowded with narrative platforms that are in some ways way more exciting, especially to young people, and we need to realize the fact that we're underdogs and we're no longer the powerful medium that we once were in the 20th century. And that's a kind of different headspace, you know, because everybody kind of walked around with a swagger, uh, you know, pre-2008 because we were the big dogs on the blocks, and I'm talking filmmakers, and it's just not the case anymore. And I'm not, you know, putting down the other mediums. I'm just saying it's just the reality. And I see a change with agents and with actors. I see agents being more cooperative, almost more sympathetic uh, to sad sacks like me that are trying to make a formally aggressive, dramatic feature for 90 minutes and under 500,000. Um, actors love you know, what I do um, because it's still the best way to display an actor's talent. Um, and uh, I feel that there's a lot of a real sympathy that's happened through agents in the past few years to the struggles of the low-budget producer. Um, but I'm not seeing any, to be honest with you, I'm not seeing any compassion from the distributors. And I'm seeing a kind of uh, just a blind eye from a lot of distributors about our sympathy. And I think we have to look at, um, what I'm trying to say is that we have to kind of look at this whole situation called cinema from a holistic point of view uh, because in many ways the format, you know, is in transition. I won't say under siege, but it's in transition. Um, one of the, you know, one of the things that um, I think that we also have to understand that if you're going to be making a film 
uh, you're going to have, by a certain degree, less eyes on it than you've ever had before. The audience demand is less. And I'm just somebody, as a producer, who says to somebody, if you can tell me why you have to do this in film and why this story can only work in film, not in any other medium, then we have a reason to make the film. And that's different than what a lot of people would say, which is, is there an audience? And what are the audience's numbers for this or this story? And that's, I, that's not how I think about what I do. I have a kind of a, a, a love and a commitment to the medium. And it's oblivious to the fact that a lot of the audience has gone away, or certainly a lot of young audience is not there. And uh, it's a blind faith in some ways. And I just take a certain solace from where the novels were in the 50s that, that it will always be there. And it'll be there smaller than it's ever been. And I just feel that if you're somebody that feels the same way about the medium, then I think it's worth making a film. And I'm not saying that there won't ever be any more zeitgeist moment films. There will be. I think American Sniper was one. Um, it still has that power. But I think TV has really taken that brass ring in terms of being how people spend their time, how they use the convenience of the platform, and how they digest an enormous amount of visual narrative material in a short amount of time because of the fact that you can set it up on your own schedule. You can watch 90, you can watch a half hour, you can binge and watch 12. And that's something that's, that, that we'll never be able to beat. And um, we'll still have zeitgeist moments in film. Films will still occasionally capture it. And I do feel that there will be films that um, are very important to who we are uh, and that there will be films that we'll all consider to be classics that are yet to be made. But I think that it's far less than what it used to be. And I think it's, a little, it's more difficult than it's ever been to reach the audience. But I do believe that the strength of the medium will actually get better, it will get stronger uh, as everybody faces this reality that I've just talked about. And we get a distillation of energy that's specifically geared towards the plastics of the medium. And that's what I talk about in the article. What are the unique moments? What are the unique formal aspects of the medium? And the fact that there's exceptions to what I say to the degree that there are TV shows that use cinematic means doesn't you know, disprove, somebody said in Variety, oh, there's a, he must not have known that it was a Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, episode that was silent because I talk about silence as being one of the major aspects of cinema. And that's fine, you know, that's, <laughs> that doesn't disprove my point that a 90 minute story can be told in complete silence. And the Buffy Vampire Slayer had a small episode maybe in a long story that was, had a silent moment. Um, but the nature of how you were engaging in a story in a silent film is very different than how you engage in the narrative aspect of a, of a TV episode or any other platform. So overall, I'm going to give some opportunity for comments or uh, questions or doubts. Uh, but overall, I just want to say, and I, I hope I don't sound overly negative, um, I'm just trying to face the reality, especially myself, somebody who struggles to do something <clears throat> which is about creating visual drama that is very directly engaging the world and who we are. Um, a lot of what a film is, is it's part of the distraction industry, and I'm not in that space with film. Um, you know, the distraction industry is mostly ruled by sports and gaming, and film has been, is in that to some degree. Um, and for those who are actually looking to engage, uh, it's harder than ever. Um, and, and 
I'm, I'm, I'm more committed than ever to stay in the space, to stay in the cinema space. And I actually believe that things are going to get better to the extent that the audience will start to become more specifically orientated to what is a cinematic experience when they choose it. And there will be less films, and I think that's going to be a good thing. Uh, and I do believe that we've got some amazing films yet to be made. There may be some in this room. And if you've chosen this medium for the right reason, I believe that you'll find an audience, and I think the audience will come to you. Um, but we're in a transition stage, so it's a little rocky right now. Um, questions, anybody? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on films that kind of borrow a little bit more, at least for me, kind of an experiential design. So like, I would consider Gravity and Birdman to be those, where it's kind of a wide angle, the pacing's almost like real time, um, and how that can be seen almost as borrowing from the pacing of video games or things that are experiential, but it's also uniquely cinematic. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's nothing, there's no borrowing from video games going on in Gravity or anything, you know, I mean, it's just, it's the aspect of, of pure cinema was, was about, you know, the first time these people sat in this audience and a train started to come towards them, which was the first cinema that a lot of people saw, you know, a lot of people ducked under the seats. So that aspect of engaging with a physical world in that spatial two-dimensional component has always been really part of what cinema has been. And gravity in the widescreen, and especially now with, with, with the use of 3D, which is, of course, old technology, is just another way. What becomes interesting is how you tell your story within that spatial component and to what degree that spatial experience you know, is tied to what the story is. And so for the first two acts of gravity, you know, it's a great exchange between space and time and that's perfectly suited for, the, for, for, for that narrative. And, you know, with uh, Birdman, you know, he's trying to basically imitate um, this concept of, of, the, of, the, of the long take camera, you know, um, and uh, the, the long shots of no editing giving you this particular type of paranoia or this hyper consciousness of the frame and what's outside the frame, which is particularly cinematic. It's not so much video game, because I think in video game, I don't think you're as aware of the frame line as you are in the cinema experience. So the cinema of paranoia, the basic idea of horror, is in a cinema situation, is not so much the immediacy of a shock or a bloody head or something hitting you, but that paranoia of not knowing what's outside the frame. So where is the killer or where is the leopard in the sense of the early black cat you know, in those films. And of course, everything David Lynch is about is about as much negative space, what's outside the line, frame line. So I don't know enough about video games to know if they're engaging with the frame line and the, the frame as much as that, but Gravity and Birdman were, were films that are basically constructed around that tension between what's in the frame and what's outside the frame. And I don't know enough about video games to know if they engage in that way. But those are the, that's the core basis of like those two films. As Netflix buys more movies and wants to avoid theatrical leases, do you think that uh, influences the medium in terms of like, you know, can you have a cinematic experience if you're just watching at home? Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that uh, I talk about in the article is uh, <clears throat> this idea of the, of the viewing medium, the viewing experience. Um, yeah, the purest form for me is the, the darkened room where, the, uh, where, where uh, you go into a vault and it's dark and the chair's fixed, it doesn't move and your phone gets blocked and it's dark and you don't see anything and you're just in that world, yet you're aware that there are other people watching with you and everybody is engaged in the same way and nobody else disengages by picking up their phone. And so that is the ultimate experience because there's a kind of physicality to that that's unique. And in our homes, we may have a, a visual component to that with the wide screens, which is great, but we lack that, that communality of, the ex, of that experience in, in that room. And then what happens immediately afterwards in the lobby or at dinner afterwards. So, um, but we can't deny the fact 
<clears throat> that these TVs are fantastic and these Blu-rays are great and, you know, and that that's a, a, a great experience, you know. And uh, I also, you know, don't feel that that's what makes cinema is just what's in the room. It's really, I'm talking about grammar and there's cinematic grammar and there's TV grammar and there's also a cinematic way to tell a story and a TV way to tell a story. And so that's mostly how I define cinema. I don't talk about it purely in terms of just a physical experience. It was interesting to just talk with somebody. Um, I tell a story, I think in the article, in the 80s, <clears throat> I worked at Bleecker Street Cinema. We used to have in the 80s, we're in the 70s and 80s and 60s, and those of us who are old, lots of movie theaters all over Manhattan that would show old movies and film. And I remember uh, I worked at Bleecker Street Cinema. We had a 16 millimeter projection room called the AG room. And then we had the big room, and I worked in the AG room. And um, during the day, I'd go up to other movie theaters like the Metro or New York or Othalia to see. That's how I saw all the classics. And Dan Talbot, who owned the New Yorker theater and a theater chain, and then said to me, what are you doing? I was 21 or something. What are you going to do with your life? I said, oh, I'm just going to stay in this space. I'll be a projectionist for my life, just watching film or whatever. It's cool. This is." And he said, well, there's this thing called VHS, so you better think about something else because you're done. And I was like, what are these? Like, well, this theater will be closed. This is all going to close, and film will go away. And there's this thing called VHS that's going to be happening soon. I sold all of the titles, and we're going to put them out on VHS, and everybody's going to watch at home. And I still remember standing outside the Metro when he told me about this new technology, which blew me away and scared me so much. So I've been dealing with the fear of new technology for a while. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'm not so worried about all these other platforms in terms of degrading the experience. I think it's declined the total numbers, but it's always going to be present. It's going to be something unique uh, that we have in terms of the room experience. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, uh, like, as we make these films that are very cinematic and true to ourselves as filmmakers, how, how we can engage these younger audiences that aren't going to the theaters with, while still staying true to our, our vision that maybe isn't as snappy and exciting as what's on TV. Yeah, I mean, there's only, I mean, you know, this is the elitist in me. There's only so much we can do. And as artists, if we're dedicated to speaking in a particular medium because we love a particular medium, then we're going to do it regardless of the fact that, you know, young people at this moment are not going there or it's not hip. You know, painting now is back in. I heard some artists talk about in Venice, uh, which, which had been out, you know, oils and ink. Uh, and uh, so at some point, you know, I'd like to fantasize or romanticize about the idea that there's going to be a young generation that's going to get off social media uh, that is going to be completely isolated to an analog experience of life to the degree that they're only going to talk to people if they're in front of them. This is my fantasy. I, I dream these things. And that they actually would fantasize and be really happy about going into a room for 90 minutes with only one thing to think about. And um, it's not now, but I do think it'll come back, and I think that's the position that we have to be in for that, ready to come back. And, you know, I don't believe in the, I mean, I do it. I do the Twittering, people I work with do the Twittering and tell other people about the film and all this stuff and the social media stuff, and we do it. Um, and, uh, but it's just so, I get it sent to me, but it's so, there's so much of it. I don't know how you sort through it. Uh, but we spread the word that way. We do the best we can. And, uh, I, you know, in the old days, Dan Mervish, who started Slam Dance, and you know, old timers like him and me used to walk around Sundance with sandwich boards around our neck to try to get people to go into the theater. So, you know, whatever you can do, you know, we'll do. I don't, you know, there's only so much you can do, actually, you know, so. So, I, I wonder if cinema itself, as we've entered the 21st century, has shifted also in, in terms of technology, certainly. You know, the physiological experience of watching a DCP is different than the physiological experience of watching a 35 millimeter yeah. film print. So, uh, 
And since there will be almost no, there will be exception to revival houses or whatever, there won't be no projection anymore. And so the prints won't be made, of especially newer releases. I mean, I think we've already kind of jumped the shark in, in that way because we've changed what cinema is in its kind of fundamental foundational core. So the way we tell stories perhaps hasn't, but literally the, the experience of sitting in a theater has shifted and is actually much more like sitting in a living room now because our, our brain is actually reacting to the image the way we react to the image in our living rooms now. It didn't used to be that way. So I wonder if you have thoughts on no, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally true, you know, that physical aspect of flickering light and that physical aspect of being around the flickering light and what that means on a, on a physiological aspect is totally true. And all I could say is that, you know, I've been going to the 35 millimeter black and white scope film print series at BAM, you know, it's been filled, a lot of young people. Um, I th still think the demand will be there, um, but I still feel that when you know, I saw under her skin the Scarlett Johansson film three times. I went to the to the 14th Street Theater over there, and I went three times because I I knew that physically it was an experience which was fully engaging that room. The five one sound mix was stunning, I thought, and what they did narratively, which I talk about in the arc in the article, is that there's a major. I would say the first act turning point happens through sound and happens through a spatial placement of sound when she hears the baby cry. Uh, after she's seen the baby on the beach, she's in a car and she starts to hear a baby cry. And we don't first reveal what she sees. Uh, at first we hear it. And the way it was placed in speakers at that theater at 14th Street was, was a cinematic experience for me. And I, know, I don't have a surround sound in my, I don't have a home theater. Um, and maybe that would have happened in somebody's high-end home theater, but I know for me that was a cinematic experience that was spatially connected. Uh, but in terms of the biological aspect, the, 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 that energy of 24 frames a second in light, no, there's no denying that. that that's, that's been proven by science, and we have gone past that now. But I do think revival houses like BAM, and every city has one, Oak Cliff in Dallas, showing real film prints, these a lot of theaters will do it. It's just become more, just like we've got 92nd Street Y for poetry readings, we're gonna have real cinema screens. It's just, it's, we've moved off of a complete mass medium, I think, in terms of cinema, and I think we're going to something less of a mass medium. But it won't be for newer films being made because there won't be prints made anymore. And so it's only in the revival. That's, that's true, yeah, except, except I, I do have an idea of, you know, now there's a lot of independent filmmakers who are shooting in film. It's becoming more popular. Kodak is about to announce a very big program uh, in, in, in involving that. And that is something that I think is going to possibly get us to the place where we may start to see this weird reintroduction of film projection. Um, and I think that that, that may come uh, you know, it would be either putting new films into the retro houses because somebody wants to be a purist and to show on a film print, um, but it's, it's never going to be what it was. We're past it, like you say. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about, you were talking about the grammar differences between uh, film and TV. Um, can you talk a little more about what that means? I mean, beyond um, being serial versus yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, the, 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 one of the biggest things about cinema grammar that's different than TV grammar has to do with the relationship to plot or to the script. So, you know, we say that it, TV is a writer's medium, and the TV director's job is to serve the writer. He's not there. It's not his show. He's not there to express his opinion of the script. He's there to record the script and convey it as best as he can. And what we see in cinema, or not in all cinema at all, actually rarely in American cinema, uh, we see it a lot in European cinema, but um, certainly in the classics, is we see a tension between the director and the material. So Douglas Sirk just being the most obvious one in Far From Heaven, somebody, um, uh, Todd Haynes is Far From Heaven, but 
uh, Douglas Sirk's films of the classic 50s period, he came from Germany and came from a Brechtian position towards consumerism, was handed scripts that he didn't write that he had to direct. And he couldn't even change the scripts. And he made films that are uniquely his from various screenwriters, and a lot of them were remakes of 1930s films. And so the cinematic way in which he told the story and the way he framed Jane Wyman and the way he timed the reverse angles between Jane Wyman and Rock Hudson and in all those films and the way he set up how he told that story, he was able to get his point of view in on that script, which was not actually in that script. That's the most obvious example. But basically, when we have a, a director who's engaging in a dialogue with his story with his plot to the degree that what comes out of it is a third component, which is story. And a cinematic story is different than a, t a plot. And we rarely get that in TV. Um, uh, but what we see in, in cinema is an engagement uh, with the material that creates a story that's different. And specifically, it's longer takes, it's wider shots, um, it's, uh, and, um, it's sometimes it has to do with the, the length of shots. Uh, it's TV, it doesn't lend itself very well to close-ups, to extreme close-ups. Um, it's disruptive. Uh, likewise, wide shots in TV are not really something that, um, that, 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 that work well in the narrative. They sap energy. You see a, a Turkish film like Winter Sleep or Once Upon a Time in Ayatollah, uh, which is just this unbelievable wide shots. It's a film you're engaging in the story in a cinematic way that is purely cinema. It could not happen in TV. You couldn't have that same experience in the TV, in the TV situation. Even though you'll watch it on your TV, it'll still be different. It's just a different way of engaging with plot. And the main thing about cinema is the director, the director expressing his opinion about the plot or about the story. So a lot of times I'll pick uh, projects in which the director, the film I just made, Free Indeed, which we won in, Best in, in Venice, it's a film about faith and about a faith healing. And the director comes from a very torn, uh, formerly a very extreme religious background. And he still believes in a lot of aspects of, of grace. And he's constantly in turmoil with himself about where he stands. So we picked a story in which he doesn't completely endorse or doesn't understand. So the grammar in which he engages with his story is cinematic to the degree that he's picking at his own story or trying to find himself in that story. So the way we engage with the plot in cinema is different than the way we engage with the plot in TV. Um, what do you think this whole shift means uh, for, in terms of funding for independent filmmakers? Well, I mean, I, th I think that, uh, you know, that I think that, the, you know, somebody who wants to invest in film has to have the same sense of priorities that the filmmakers have that to be in it meaning that you have to understand that it's not the cash cow that it was and I think that's pretty obvious um, most of the investors that we have that drive the film quote unquote industry are people of, of, of large wealth who value culture I mean ultimately that's what we have to say um, uh, there's a, a, a person who financed Foxcatcher didn't come out of a pure profit motive. There's a belief that we can monetize and we try to, but if you're not, nobody's in the film business to make money solely because there's other ways to make it. You know, uh, buy an apartment in New York, you know, don't spend two million on a film if all you want to do is make money. But I think as we come to this understanding that we're, that the medium has moved to another place. And in some ways, it's going to, as it, as it regenerates, it's going to become more powerful. Um, and it's going to be able to really capture an audience in a way. Once a lot of, I think, Deadwood clears, um, we're going to see an actual distillation of the power of cinema. And I think that the investors um, want to have that belief and faith the same as the filmmakers do. 
And I think that there are a lot of investors that are currently in the space that have that faith. And there's a return on investment that's beyond dollars. So I think that's important to understand. And I think that everybody that's in the space understands that there is a concept of return of investment that's different than just dollars. And that may sound, you know, weird saying that here in America, but um, there are people who believe that. Uh, and there's a value system uh, that a lot of people believe in, which only film, certain films can express. And I think a lot of people want to believe that cinema can be part of a solution and a part of connection to humanity, which is, can maybe in the long term help us all in a way that's beyond just re immediate return on dollars. And engaging with people and humans through this medium of cinema, I think is what really will engage, does engage a lot of investors. And that power is something that I think is beyond just simply talking about the numbers. Do you believe that all of the films that are made today uh, result in a cinematic experience? No, no. No, it is rare actually in American indie cinema that there's actually real cinema made. It's very unusual. Mostly, especially in indie cinema, you have a lot of people who come in as first timers who just want to try it out or don't really know what the medium's about. And uh, there's a lot of just turn the camera on and record, you know, and just uh, let the actors do their thing and no, uh, no engagement with grammar. There's very few films made today in America that really uh, involve the director being as powerful as he can be. Um, there's, there's a small handful of American directors who assert the power that they can have and are fully expressing themselves through the full aspects of the medium. You know, so uh, you've got the full range in the medium, editing, color palette, you know, narrative, all these aspects through which you can express yourself. And there's very few artists that have so much to say that are firing on all those elements of the medium. And that's where you get genius or that's where you get masterpiece is when you have somebody bursting with talent, bursting with the energy to speak that is using all these various aspects of the cinema medium. And generally what we have in America is somebody using one-tenth of its potential. So no, it's a lot, of a lot of films we have aren't really purely as powerfully cinematic as they could be. I've got a question about the future of cinema. I uh, remember you mentioned you used to go to your local theater to get the true experience of the film. Uh, and you also mentioned that with modern technology, people are moving more and more towards television for shorter than. Uh, however, with the invention of virtual reality uh, devices such as Oculus Rift or things, people can be immersed more than they ever have. I'm curious about your idea where cinema is going to go in the future in regards to that. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's exciting is, you know, and I, I put the helmet on at Sundance and saw the bird and all the other things, and it was great, you know. Uh, but the, cure, the, the, the aspect of the, that I still ask is, 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 is how are we telling a compelling story that is cinematic, that is linking us as people or linking us to the world? And so... Um, if, if we can do that in that three-dimensional format, that's great. It's still going to be different than cinema because of, the, because of the way it uses the frame line. But if that can happen, that's great, you know. I just don't know if it will or how it will. And I think initially whenever new technologies come around, um, they basically start off, I think the first thing that happens is porn. Uh, you know, that porn takes over the medium. You know, it happened with VHS. It, happen with the, a lot of the internet, and I think that'll happen with the helmet. And then <laughs> maybe it'll go beyond that. Um, I don't know. I hope so, you know. It seems to me that there's just more and more films being made you know, nowadays. Um, and all the panelists talk about the saturation of these films. Um, so to go from the previous panel, which discussed the saturation the musicians are benefiting from, you know, from composing because there's just everybody and their grandma is making films. So how do you go from that to your kind of forecast that in the future maybe uh, it's going to reverse and actually, you know, people are stopping it, they're going to stop it. Yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a, it's a good point. I mean, 
The other thing is, you know, John Sloss mentioned at a South by Southwest panel a couple of years ago that there's also more investors than there've ever been. There's more private equity in our space than there've ever been before. And yet I'm talking about a decline of a medium. And there's more films being made than ever before. So it's weird, you know, there, there, it, how, does, how does this settle out? I don't know, but I do feel that, um, you know, it's a problem. That's not a problem. We can't solve the problem by saying to people they should make less films. Um, what we can do is all of us kind of just read the weather, like I'm trying to say right here, and say, you know what, the audience is wanting less film. And what has been doing well are true cinematic experiences. And if you're going to do it, you really should do it well and should do it in a specific way um, that's cinematic. And that's all I can hope is that there's going to be more fallout as the other platforms become more popular. There'll be more fallout from cinema and that people will start to actually just make more TV pilots in 20 minute episodes. Because a lot of the 90 minute films that are at Sundance are basically TV pilots in terms of their grammar. So hopefully that will change and people will start to come to recognize what I'm foreseeing. But yes, at this moment, we're at a very strange place in which there is that saturation. Um, one of the arguments I've heard recently why some of the younger audiences aren't attracted to these cinematic experiences is that they are seeking out more story worlds that they know are gonna continue to live on. And so they can engage with it multiple times and it'll be different each time. Um, instead of something that's a, you know, a finite 30 minutes or 90 minutes. So I was wondering, with your vision of um, all the cinematic language and how that's going, can that coexist with bigger, broader story worlds? It may be, but it's all accounts what you want. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not really interested in what somebody else, you know, how they want to engage with my story to the degree that they want to change it. I want an author's experience. I want Jake Mahaffey's opinion on faith. I want Rick Alverson's opinion on entertainment and comedy. I want, you know, David Gordon Green's opinion of, of, a, of a character. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't need to engage with that. I want to understand it, you know. I want to understand their perspective. And I want to have that full empathetic experience where I actually lose myself to the degree that I'm in a Rick Alverson film. So the fact that there's a whole lot of other young people that don't feel they're engaged unless they're touching something or they're moving around or, you know, I can't do anything about that. I, yeah. I think it's more of a, like, why aren't there a lot of, I guess, sequels in independent cinema right now? Like, how, why do the story worlds only usually live as one movie rather than several movies? Yeah, I mean, again, it's just the idea that the self-contained experience of 90 minutes or 120 minutes, I, I always feel that the medium is actually closer to music than it is to the novel. The pure aspects of cinema are closer to music. So it's a 90 minute, 120 minute physical experience for that amount of time is equivalent to like a, a symphony or a particular music piece. So it can stand on its own just in that space, so. But, yep. You spoke about the uh, unique uh, requirements of uh, directors in cinema and how the skills are very different from the other platforms that exist. Uh, do you see, uh, as the cinema uh, space uh, sh shrinks or, or distills, as you say, do you see um, uh, directors uh, who perhaps want to do that for a living uh, just bouncing between all the different platforms to, you know, pay their bills with some TV and reality and then, you know, uh, for the meal and then for the real do, you know, what they actually want to do. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other issue, you know, about <clears throat> if you're in a medium which is declining in, in mass demand, how do you make a living doing it? That's a whole other issue. And it's actually not an issue that is, that hasn't already been dealt with by every other medium. Um, when you're a novelist, there's very few novelists, uh, literary fiction that are not teachers. Um, a lot of the directors that I work with are teachers. Um, and in reality, 
uh, very few people, even on the highest level, make all their money just from cinema. I mean, I think Ridley Scott or those they make films like occasionally to for 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 jollies, but they make football commercials or commercials. That's how they make their money. And even the studio, even the company that owns Universal Studios, that company does not make money all their money from cinema. That's just one fraction of their income. Uh, and likewise, there is really very few people who totally live from making films. Uh, and, it's, and that's just the nature of the art form. Um, and so I think it's totally justified where we, have, where we see people who are commercial directors who make, a lot of people I work with, make their money directing commercials or DPing commercials. And they come to cinema experience where, um, you know, for very little money to, as a refresher or as a, as, a, as, a, as a regeneration of inspiration. And commercials, you know, like TV, draw on cinema. And so everybody who's in the visual space at some point wants to engage with the pure aspects of cinema. And that's, that works well with the fact that you can't really totally make a living in cinema. So uh, it, I think it, it, it's fine. I, I don't see it really as a problem. I mean, I wish we all could just do what we do and get paid for it and live off of it, but it's pretty difficult. But it's always been a problem for the arts uh, and for people in the arts, unless your cost of living is really low and you're not in New York City. Alrighty, everybody. Thank you.